um, I thought it would be interesting to compare the different spiritual traditions that come to the West a little bit. Uh, mm, how to say? We are exposed now to the Asian tradition since maybe 50 years or so. And um, so there's various traditions coming to the West. And um, in our tradition, uh, the main practice is what's called Lamrim, or the Graduate Path to Enlightenment, that encompass all Buddha's teachings. Um, and I would like to compare that approach because it's a kind of unique approach that you don't find in other traditions where you use actually not only uh, meditation but you use something that's called analytical meditation. And that's something that we don't know in the West. So I would like to show what the other approach do and what the Lamrim approach or the graduate path approach does to the mind. So you can see, have an introduction to these different approaches. <clears throat> um, nice to see you, John. <laughs> uh, uh, Judith, can you hear well enough? Yes, no. Uh, no, you cannot hear me good enough. All right. Is it better now? Yes. All right. So please tell me you know, if it's not loud enough. I'll try to correct it. Okay. So, but before that, I thought it would be nice to do a little meditation, you know, five, ten minutes of meditation, uh, just to uh, settle the mind. And to start with, I would like that we chant uh, the mantra of the Prajnaparamita, uh, Tayata Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva. So we do this three times. And this mantra uh, comes in the Heart Sutra and means it is like this, gone, gone, gone beyond, gone completely beyond to perfect awakening. So it's, uh, it's uh, in essence the five stage to full enlightenment you know, that is described in the Prajnaparamita Sutra. And this way of chanting it came from Lama Yeshe. Uh, he used to do it at Kopan in different places. So we take a deep breath and then we chant it very slowly. And we do that three times. And at the end of the third repetition, so uh, when I say deep breath, so at that moment you take a deep breath and then body, so, and you let your mind ride on the sound and you expand your mind into space. And then you stare into that space of your mind without any thought or any concept, as long as you can. And then when the thought arises, try to check whether you can see where the thought comes from. You know, in your space of awareness, you have that space, and suddenly a thought pops up. Where, where, did, where, actually, where did it pop up? You know, where, where did that thought come from? Into your mind. You know? And then suddenly there's more little bubble of thought start popping up, right? And then suddenly there's another th thing that happens. Oh, these are my thoughts. Before they were just thoughts. They were, there was no owner of thought. And suddenly there's a me. Oh, this my. Oh, I like this too. Oh, oh yeah, I should really do that. So we appropriate the thoughts. You know, and then once the thoughts are appropriated, we, uh, we like them or, or dislike them, and then some kind of emotional response comes to the thought. We want to act upon them. You know? And then the personality starts building up. You know? So try to see that evolution in your mind. You know? So th the point is to be completely relaxed. You, know, you chant the mantra and then you just sort of stare into space. And it might happen and it might not happen, and it's fine. You know, just whatever, whatever you observe, you know, you just observe it, okay? Just relax, you know. No big pressure. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, once it's comfortably, and relax the mind, the body, there's no tension. And for me, it's a little bit hot, so I take off a layer. <coughs> so 
So those which know the mantra, you know, they can, and those that, those who don't know, they just listen. That's fine too. Or after the first repetition, you might know it, and you can join in for the second or the third. Ta. So this mind of ours can be peaceful, can be happy, can be joyous, can be loving, can be compassionate, but it can also be agitated by anxiety, stress, low self-esteem, depression, anger, obsession. So the, all these states of mind happen within that mind. 
within that space, the space takes on different color. Different emotion arise within it. And we experience such a such state. So one's mind takes on different color. So there are happy thoughts, peaceful thoughts, unhappy thought, unhappy emotion. All right. So now, what we are dealing with when we try to meditate is with is dealing with this very mind, right? Is try to make this mind peaceful, happy, gentle. Basically, make our mind happy. So the purpose of meditation, any form of meditation, is to make the mind happy, right? So in the world we learn how to read, how to write, how to uh, learn a craft, uh, we learn how to make a living, but we don't know how to have a happy mind. You know, we don't know, we don't learn how to be peaceful, how to be joyous, how to be well in our, our skin. How do you say? Is an expression like that? Huh? Yeah, comfortable with our skin, you know. So this, uh, nowadays, is not taught in schools, right? How to just to be a happy human being, you know? So we learn how to crave for the latest iPad or iPhone, you know? We learn how the advertisement tell you you need this and that and that to be happy. And if you buy this and that, you will be happy. Or if you go and go a uh, peaceful, happy mind, right? So now uh, there's all these yoga courses, mindfulness classes, and uh, compassion training, and uh, what else nowadays, the latest. Uh, yeah, and then there's uh, Mahamudra, and then Dzogchen, and uh, Vipassana, so then reciting of mantra, MT, you know, Transcendental Meditation. You know, there's all these different methods, and they all, all their aim is the same, is to make us, you know, find some inner peace, some inner contentment, right? So they are all methods, they are valid, you know? So how to say, <clears throat> like when you go to a restaurant, you have all these different disease, disease, di <laughs> dishes. <laughs> <laughs> dish, dish, dishes, dishes, thank you. you know. So if you came to Russian and on the money there were only one dish, you know, it would be, oh, strange restaurant, right? <laughs> Wouldn't be happy, right? So same thing with spirituality, if there would be only one spiritual method, it wouldn't fit for us, you see. We're all so diverse, we have also different interests and different psychological makeup. So it's good to have different religion and different spiritual tradition and different sp spiritual method. You know? And each one uh, suits a particular need, you know, has a particular function. <coughs> so this, uh, I think it's excellent. You know? Also psychologically, we in the West, we come to spirituality from a very specific angle, you know. It's very different than, uh, let's say, in Buddhist society, like in Asia or in India, you know. The West, uh, for us, most of us, we, we grew, grew up in a Christian tradition that somehow has uh, disappointed many of us. So we come with, a, um, you know, a kind of skepticism towards organized religion because somehow we have been disappointed by that. So that's 
one angle some of us come to the path and for other people we don't look for a spiritual tradition we just uh, want a quick fix for our problem mm -hmm. you know let's say we stressed and we want some uh, relief of that stress you know we have anxiety we want to find a solution for our anxiety you know or uh, we suffer from depression we want to fix our depression you know? so we come with, with a particular need right or are we angry you know and we want to solve our anger problem you know or we have an addiction problem you know for this and that and we want to solve our addiction problem right so we come to a spiritual center with a particle with a particle purpose we don't want to find the meaning of life right that's not why we came you know we have a, a particular problem and we want to solve that problem right so that's why a meditation like uh, mindfulness you know a stress stress reduction you know type of meditation is very popular why how did it start these people were stressed anxiety you know so much problem and they couldn't cope with all their thought all the stress right so they wanted something simple to calm down their mind their over agitated mind so let's watch the breath moment by moment you see, instead of thinking of all what went wrong before and all what you still have to do after, you know, the mind busy, 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 busy and never stopping. So let's watch the breath and bring it back to the present moment. You know, don't think about the past, don't think about the future. Just be here now in the present moment. Right? And the more you let go of the past, the less you anticipate the future, the more there is peace here now. You see the mind calms down and you just be here now you know and in that state you start discovering oh actually there's a little bell in front of me i wasn't able to see it because i was in my head you know i was not not able to see i was thinking about my worrying and you know thing I, I couldn't see that no and actually oh there's another human being there how beautiful you know i couldn't relate to him because i was in my head Right? So this kind of mindfulness brings this kind of healing brings you back to the present moment and appreciate life as it is. You know, you start reappreciating things just by being here now, not being in the past, not being in the future. Right? So this is helpful and helps many people. For example, now they teach it in hospitals and in business enterprise no because people are so busy and they cannot they, they are not in the present anymore they you know their head is in the past or future things like that so this helps them you know it's very practical And then, so this leads you, some people get kind of interested in that and want to go deeper. And then do the different type of calm abiding meditation, right? Where you, you try to sustain your attention in the present moment, right? So in that approach, uh, uh, mindfulness, basically you stay in the present moment. And when the thought arises, you just let them go. You are aware they are there, but you don't hook on them. You just let them pass, right? So in the meditation on karma abiding or shamatha, basically you want to tame the mind, you want to be able to hold it onto something without it moving away, right? And this produces a deeper inner peace and joy by the mind being tamed. You see, the mind constantly wants to go here and there, right? So if you stop it, the mind becomes very peaceful and very uh, supple. Uh, there's a special type of inner joy that arises from a mind that is completely tamed, right? So this type of practice you find in Vipassana tradition, in Zen tradition, you know, and also in the uh, contemplative tradition, you would focus on a mantra or a, uh, on a visualization, you know, or on the breath. So you would focus on one thing and constantly bring the mind onto that object and extend the duration of not losing it, 
right? Till you can, for example, for 10 minutes not lose that object, and then 20 minutes, then half hour, you can still the mind. And as you still the mind, you go from the superficial level of the mind, you go deeper, deeper, you know, deeper, deeper in your psychic, in the subconscious, or into your soul. You know, you, 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 you go deeper into who you really are very deeply, you know. You, you start discovering, you know, you, you more, more intimate thought, you more intimate feeling, you know, you, you, what you really seek in life, you know. You, you come to the surface of your being, you know, how to say your, your problem of this month or, or this year, then this life. So it comes, you go, go deeper in touch with you with this type of meditation, right? <clears throat> but of course, the problem is you do this meditation and then you stand up and go outside and go back to your daily life. Not much has changed, right? So you have this conflict situation between your spiritual seeking, you know, going deeper in your mind and your everyday life. Right? The problems with relationship problem, you know, with your family, with your colleagues at work, the pressure of your job, you know, and the traffic and all these things, right? So the, the method is uh, a little bit limited. Mm -hmm. the, lim the method is just watching your breath, just bringing your mind to the present moment, right? So there's not much tool there. The only tool is to watch your mind. Right, and bring it all, always back to the present. Okay? And then in the Vipassana or um, Mahamudra or Dzogchen tradition, so there you have a, a teaching that shows that uh, the world exists, how to say, the world is not exactly as it seems to us. You see, we see everything solid and concrete. But nowadays, to quantum physics, we see that things are actually not exactly as they appear deep down, right? So all this superficial level, how we perceive the world, is actually just one way you see the world, right? There's another way, more deep, you know? So in meditation, you can start seeing that. You see, where is the thought? Where does it come from? Where does it go? What is its nature? You know, what is the nature of the mind? What is the nature of the body? What is the nature of the world around you? And then things start becoming a bit lighter. You know, we live in a drama where everything is solid and concrete. You know, whereas actually in reality things are more like dancing energy. You know, it's, kind of, it's like a, a beautiful play of energy constantly changing. You know? So this type of meditation makes you aware that life is not a drama. You know, there's a lightness. It's, there's, a, there's a lot of humor, and you can joke about it. You know, it's not so serious. You know, when we die, nobody dies. You know, when somebody gets killed, nobody gets killed. You know, ultimately, it's just the body. You leave the body behind, and your soul or your consciousness goes on. You know, you don't die. Right? So it's not the end. You know? It's just the drama constantly changing. You know? So you see, uh, when you hear these things, it's intellectual. Oh yeah, maybe, maybe. But when you meditate, you actually experience these things. You know it from inside. So it's a completely different thing. You know? you get, when you go deep into meditation, you have this experience. I am eternal. You know, it's not just somebody here say, you, you experience your consciousness in a very deep way and you know from that perspective you have always existed, you exist now and you will always exist because you're pure consciousness, you're not this body. You live in this body for a while and then you go and you move on. You, know? you have that experience. You know, it's very different when you hear that and when you actually experience it. You know, because when you experience it, it's your own reality, it's your own, it's yours, you know, it's not some, what somebody else says, it's what you experience. So that's beautiful, you see. And then, of course, 
uh, in society another thing that nowadays people become interested is that um, how to say our society you know modern capitalist is very selfish is self-oriented me me my profit my gain you know I need this and things like that so oriented on me 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 right Whereas actually there's another way of being when we open our heart to other and care generally for our partner, our children, our parents, uh, the member of our community, our society. So this open heart and uh, living for others brings so much joy, you know? so much well-being when you really care for others instead of being obsessed always by me, 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 my problem, my uh, where, when will I be happy? When will I fall in love? When I will get a new car? When I will get a new job? Me, me, me. You know? And of course, when one, as soon as one has one thing, something else, we need something else, and it's endless. And after a while, what brings us satisfaction now? Well, it's not good enough. We need a new thing. You know? The phone two years ago was fine, but now somehow this year is not good enough. You know, because a new toy came out with a slight little thing, you know, a little bit more pixel on the screen, you know, so, oh, now my old thing is, you know, is useless, you know, <laughs> like that. Anyway, and society is very good, you know, the advertisement society is very good to make you feel that you miss and that you will be very happy, you know, once you get the latest toy. Yet, once we get it, it's very nice, it's very funny, you know, when you see something in the, in the, uh, when you go shopping and you see something in the window, you know, oh, that dress is so beautiful, you know, I really need, you know, I'll be so happy having, and, you know, and it's so, so excited to buy, and you buy it, and as soon as it is yours, you don't even need to put it on, it doesn't have the excitement it had before. As soon as it is yours, you know, it's not anymore the same. You know, I had the, sa the thing with the watch once, you know. <laughs> I, you know, uh, I, li uh, I lived in Geneva and I worked and, and then I, I needed a new watch. Not this one, you know, actually not this one. Uh, another one, because it had the altimeter, you know, that said the altitude you are on. It had all these little gadgets in that mount, uh, watch, you know, the uh, uh, compass. You know, uh, all these things, you know, and, uh, and I saw it in the wind, I said, ah, oh, you know, I mean, so <laughs> ah, yeah. it was $300, you know, so it was a bit expensive, you know, you know, so I went back and forth in front of the window, you know, and, and then I went back to work, and, and then three days later, keep doing back, you know, it's, oh, it's still there, no, 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 oh, no, it's $300, no, I won't pay $300, then I would go further away, and then, oh, but oh, I would be so happy if I had that watch, and, you know, and it went back a few days like that, you know, and then I couldn't resist, I went to buy that watch, you know, and I looked it in the shop, and that all this function, you know, very exciting, you know, and I bought it, you know, and soon enough, a day later, you know, then I put it on. And then I didn't like it because it was too heavy. <laughs> you know, and I have worn it maybe ten times. I don't like it because it's too heavy. <laughs> yes, it has all this function, but it's too heavy. And I didn't notice because I was so obsessed by all this function. I didn't realize that it was more heavy than what I'm used to. <laughs> And I think we all have exam stupid example like that, you know, we all have done these kind of things, right? So it just shows how, you know, how our mind is. We think that when we buy this and that and that, that we'll be happy. But more often than not, it doesn't really satisfy us for very long, you know? Then we need some, then we think, oh, but if I get this and that, then I will be happy, you know? So what, Buddhist, what Buddha discovered, that the greatest happiness is you don't need anything. The greatest happiness is contentment. It's some, actually, the greatest happiness is when you don't need anything. We think that the problem is not with the need, it's to get what we need and then we will be happy. But the Buddha said it's endless, you know, and you will never have enough. 
you know you will never be satisfied going that road down that road you know that the, the true happiness comes when you don't need anything when you completely satisfy the way you are with the thing you have you know it's just contentment you know, that state of mind is peace and happy just to be content So if we have contentment in our mind and loving kindness, you know, gentleness, caring for other, that will fulfill us, you know, that will bring us joy and happiness and a purpose in life, you know, that's beauty, that, you see, those states of mind, they are truly happy. And we all know that, you know, for example, uh, at Christmas or things like that, when you make some kids, you know, often the person which makes the gift is happier than the one that receives it. You know, the joy of giving something, of thinking about what would make that person happy, and you know, the joy of packing it up and giving it brings you more happiness than actually receiving something. You know, it's very interesting. <coughs> oh, I have to watch. I was said that I had to make a break after one hour. <laughs> so. so all these different methods are very useful, you see. But they don't and all these methods exist in Tibetan Buddhism, you see, they are little they are extra taken out of the path to enlightenment of the whole Buddhist teaching. They are little Extract, you know, little thing taken out out of the whole picture. Now, the graduate path to enlightenment is this eighty-four thousand teaching that the Buddha has given over the course of his that stage by stage to lead us to enlightenment. You know? So that's what the graduate path to enlightenment is: is this stage by stage meditation that lead us to enlightenment. So now. Hey, what are you talking about? We were speaking about making the mind happy here now and developing love and compassion. And now you tell us about enlightenment. What is that? Right? So, what the Buddha discovered is that our mind is fundamentally pure and our mind pervades all that exists. You know, that we have the potential to be fully omniscient. Our mind has unlimited potential. Right? The mind, our, our very mind, each one of us, has the potential to see all the past, present, future, all that exists. You know? And live in a state of utter bliss forever. That's the potential each one of us have. Right? But we don't know it. And because we don't know it, we think that the purpose of life is to have a new car and have a pension fund and then retire somebody, somewhere nice. That's the purpose of our life. Completely forgetting that there's a complete other dimension of our human psychic things that we can aspire to. No? And so the Buddha discovered that and taught that for 50 years. You know, this method leading to full enlightenment. You know, where not only are you happy and blissful in this life, but you will be so forever in all your subsequent lives, forever. So that's a pot that potential each one of us have. It's completely amazing to think that there's more to life than growing old and dying. You know? So each one of us has this incredible potential. And we discover that by discovering our consciousness, by going deep in our mind and try to figure out what is that? What is it to be conscious? What it is to exist? What makes me think I exist? You know, what is it I exist? What does that refer to? What is it to say I am, I'm conscious, I exist? What is that phenomena, consciousness? awareness. You know? Is it something material? Is it something immaterial? You know, if you go deep, deep, deep into it, you know, it's like a huge space that opens up with unlimited potential.
and our heart can care. You see, we care for our partner, our parents, our children. But our caring mind can expand to care for all human beings on this planet, for all the animals on this planet, and all sentient beings in the whole universe. There's no limit to the expansion of your heart, mind can do and care for. So he says an enlightened being care for all living beings in the universe, like a mother care for his only child. He says a Buddha's love for each being is hundred times more intense than a mother for her only child. So an enlightened being has the same care for each one of us. This with this strong intensity. And a Buddha has this care, not only for the people who like him, but also for the people who don't like him. He has the same love, compassion for the people that care for him and the people who don't. And we, each one of us, have the potential to have that state of mind. You see, we can expand our lovingness, our caring, our compassion, so that in our mind we identify with each and every living being and care for their well-being and aspire to reach to lead each and every one to the highest happiness. We can each one of us can induce that state of mind through training. You know, it's it's achievable. You know, and there are methods, graduate methods to lead you to that state of consciousness. You know. So it's beautiful the potential each of us as human beings have. You know? And we limit ourselves to you know, little things in our daily life. And we think because everybody does that, that's why we live. You know? And whereas this, this amazing different dimension that can open up to us. You know? Also, you see, we think it doesn't matter so much what I do, what I say my state of mind, because anyway I'm going to die, you know? But actually, what if you continue after death with your same thought, your same emotion, your same hang-ups, your same obsession, your same anger, your same resentment, that it never ends, you know? So you see, the problems you don't solve in this life, these problems, they continue with you. The grudges you have continue with you. Your resentment continues with you. But also your love, your compassion, your qualities uh, continue with you. Right? So whatever beautiful or ugly human beings we become, that beautiful and ugly living being will continue when he leaves his body. Right? So, death is just leaving this body behind. That's all. So now, whatever spiritual quality you develop in this life, that spiritual quality will, will come with you. You see, whatever you gain now, that will go with you, you know. And whatever you haven't developed yet, that you still have to develop in the future, right? So, for example, I'll take a very personal example. You know? So one important meditation is to realize how precious a human life is, what incredible spiritual potential we have is one of the first meditation one does. Is to realize, you see, one's consciousness is something immaterial and has life without beginning and without end. We are in a stream of life, life after life, right? So we come here, we are like a pilgrim. You know, we, we're born here for 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, about, you know. So we just come, we are just passing through. Right? And then our consciousness moves on, finds another body, has another experience, and goes on and on and on like that. Right? So, but this present opportunity is unique. Because there are many places in the universe we go born is much worse than here. Right? Where there's much more suffering, 
much less intelligence, you know, much more difficulty. In this life, we're born with this body, we have lots of freedom, you know. Look in some country, if you're born a woman, you know, you, you're under the control of your husband, you cannot even drive a car, you know, can you believe? You cannot drive a car, you know, you cannot go in the street alone, you know, you, you have to always have a male partner with you, you know. So we have this freedom, we live in a society where it's not like that, right? And then the uh, uh, places where there's famine, places where there's war, you know, where is, uh, how to say, uh, um, say, you know, some kind of uh, political situation where you have no freedom, right? Where you're coerced to do things. So you have basically have no basic freedom. We are not born in a situation like, we have a lot of freedom, right? You have the freedom to think what you want, to f or follow whatever spiritual tradition you want, or not follow a spiritual tradition. You can play any sport you want, you can study anything you want. There's so much freedom, right? And then at this present moment there is on this planet spiritual beings which have realized incredibly high realization, you know, which have this mind that care for each and every living being, you know, and knows the method to bring being to universal happiness, you know, to a state of being where they will never suffer again. There are beings here amongst us that will never suffer ever again. You know, we grow old and die, have problems. But there is in a state of mind is total bliss all the time, total joy. You know, they have removed them what afflicts their mind. You see, they have understand the nature of mind and they have get rid of what troubles their mind. Right? And we as human beings have this from our side we have this freedom to do whatever we want and they are teacher like that, that exists in the world, that we can encounter and follow their, path, their method and reach enlightenment, if we want. You see, we have this possibility. And that, in the universe, if you could see a million of our lives, that's very rare. You know, if you could see a million of your life, this coming together, you having freedom, having enough money, having enough good health, having intelligence, being interested by some kind of spiritual uh, tradition. So that from your side and from the outside, being born at a time and a place where the spiritual tradition is available, these two things coming together is very, very rare. You know? And yet, at this present moment, we have it. You know? And that's one of the first meditation uh, you do um, in this spiritual tradition. You see, now I introduce something. You see, this insight you come about not by watching your mind and being in the present moment. You come to this insight by thinking about certain things. You see, thinking about consciousness being something immaterial, being beginless, endless. And so you have to think and, and explore whether that's a so or not. You know, you have to study, you have to reflect. Is it, is, does a soul exist? Does a consciousness exist that is immaterial? Is it a possibility? When I die, something is going to go on or not? Is consciousness just a product of the brain? Right? So you have to, you see, you don't have to accept it passively because somebody said so. You have to inquire, you have to study, reflect, and, you know, and, and explore the topic, right? And then you come to a certain conclusion, right? And there's certain meditation you can do to go back your stream of consciousness to the time of birth, to the time of conception, and you try to intuit what was before, right? And there's also meditation you do, you imagine now you are dying, and you go to the process of die, the, the, your consciousness goes from the gross body to the subtle body, subtle mind, and to the very subtle body. Because you see, the consciousness that continues is not this consciousness, it's something more subtle. And then the subtle consciousness is not what continues, something even more subtle. Right? And there is a body that continues. It's almost like a dream body. 
you know, like the body we have in dreams. So some kind of energy body that is inseparable from the subtle mind. And that's what continues, right? So you have to explore that, you have to think about it. You follow a stream of reasoning, you know, things like that. And then you come to a certain experience, a certain state of mind. Right? So the state of mind, there's three levels. There's a level where you, st where you read something about it. You know, you read the explanation, you know, ten page in a book you read, you know. It's almost like reading a novel. You know, you read, oh yeah. So you have a certain insight, a certain understanding that comes from having read that. You know, like you read a novel, you know, you, so you, you know the character, things like that, okay. So you get a certain insight that comes from learning about this topic, okay. Then there's another level, which very few people do, is the insight that comes from reflection, from thinking about it. You see, these, so this same ten page, you read it over and over again, and you really think about it from many different perspectives. You try to look from other traditions, what they think and how, how they go about it. So you really reflect about it. Right? Then the understanding that comes is much deeper than having just read it once. You have really thought about it, you know, from many different perspectives. So the insight that comes from reflecting on it is much deeper. It's almost like, you see, at school, you know, for example, you read a text, and like a novel, right? and then you have to pass the exam on that text. Is a different level, right? So there you study very deeply because you want to get the good grade, right? So you don't want to make a mistake, so you study it very well, right? Because you have an exam to pass, right? So your interaction with that material is much deeper, right? So that's the wisdom or the insight that comes from reflection, from, refl from thinking over a topic again and again to see whether it's true or not, whether it's valid or not. And then you have a third level, that is a wisdom or the insight that comes from meditation. So by having read that and think it over again and again and again, then in deep meditation, in meditation what comes? You just know, you just see. You don't, you see, at the previous level, you needed a thought, a stream of thought. To get to that state of mind, wow, I have this precious life. Wow, it's so, I'm so fortunate. You get that through a stream of thought, by thinking, you know, all the other forms of life that are possible, that have so much problem, and I don't have that. I'm free of the, all those problems, and I have all these qualities, I have all this freedom, and what I can do with it, I can create the course to have a good rebirth, to reach liberation, to reach fully omniscient mind. You know, there's the Sutra, Metta, Tantra, and I have all these tools in my hand. I'm so fortunate. You know, wow, I have that. So it's a state of mind where you say, wow. You know? And normally you get to that state of mind by going to the stream of thought. You see, you analyze, you think about all these different, you come to there. But by repeating that on and on, you reach a point you don't need anymore to do that. You don't need to think about it anymore. You just say, wow, I have this precious life. And the whole experience comes just by saying the word, just by thinking, wow. You know? And it's a state of mind. It's so beautiful. You know, it's, wow, you know, it's so nice to be human. It's so beautiful, so precious. Oh, what I can do with this precious life that I have. So Fantastic, you know. So, you see, so that's, you get through to analytical meditation, right? So by thinking over a thing again and again, so you don't move to the next topic before you have the complete experience of that stage, you know, then it's yours, you know. Then, then you move to the next topic, hey, yeah, I have this precious, incredible potential, but is it going to last forever? Ooh, ooh. <laughs> you know, how long is going to last? You know? Is there some human beings that are eternal? 
Who are they? Where are they? You know, and then you realize that everybody has to die. You know? And then me too, I'm going to have to die. You know? So you start thinking, yeah, I have this precious opportunity for spirit, but it's not going to last. Right? So, and by thinking over it, what it does is that you have this precious jewel in your hand, and it's not going to last. So I have to use it as well as I can, you know, now. Not thinking tomorrow or next year or when I retire. You know? Now, because I don't know how long I'm going to have this precious opportunity. Right? So that's, you see, it's not at all depressing thinking about that. It actually heightens your awareness of the precious situation you are in. You know, and then you want to use each minute, you know, each thought, each emotion, you want to do something beautiful with it. So that's what you gain out of that. Right? So, hmm. oh, it's eight o'clock. <laughs> okay, ten minutes break. And those which have to go, please go. Mm -hmm. Okay, ten minutes break. Huh?